he is an author and he's got a new book out, Europe's Welfare Tradition Since 1500. Tom has had the pleasure of talking with other villages and other groups. So we're sort of lucky to get him on our schedule. And with that, I'm gonna leave it to him to do a better introduction. Okay. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you very much. And first of all, congratulations on your 10 uh, year anniversary of the village. Um, my wife and I are very enthusiastic members of the Palisades Village, and uh, it's a great organization and great to hear the kind of things you're doing. Well, I don't want to take too much time with my own introduction. I'm um, sort of an old timer. I got my uh, uh, PhD back in the day from the University of Wisconsin, and um, I was um, focused on uh, 18th century France and the Enlightenment, kind of just on the connection between social policy and what actually what people were debating at the time. And so I came out with a book in 1990 called Bureaucrats and Beggars um, from Social Policy in the 18th Century. And um, I had a number of teaching jobs, but things were a little sparse. And I had great luck of coming to the National Endowment for the Humanities in Washington in 1986 and spent 21 years uh, happily working there uh, with my uh, colleague, Fred Winter. That's how we got to know each other. And um, I got excited about spreading out from 18th century France, both in space and time. And that's sort of the, the short story of my book that really does cover um, Western Europe um, since about 1500. Um, it doesn't go very far east. It's sort of like the shape of the European Union in the year 2000. It's about th those countries, more or less. Uh, and I don't cover everything. I, just, I really pick out stories. And I'm going to try to share as much of the the uh, human interest stories about people <clears throat> as I can. So um, first of all, I want to thank the events committee, um, Wendy uh, Zanker and uh, Liz Minor, Mary Kusick, Carolyn Johnson, and Joan Smith for a recommendation, and uh, Gary Eisenman for managing the Zoom setup. And I want to thank all of you for coming to the Zoom session. Not everyone thinks that welfare is the most exciting topic in the world. so. I'm glad you took the risk of, of uh, hearing about European Europe's welfare traditions. So um, I don't have a PowerPoint, and so you may you may want me to spell something out. If we miss something, I'd be happy to follow up by email, at my personal email, which is an earthlink.net email, and it's adamspt at earthlink.net. Earthlink the PT is Peggy and Tom. So it's adamspt at earthlink.net. Also, just note that in the uh, program announcement, um, the link of uh, the book's title uh, is a link. If you push on that, you'll get some of the publisher's publicity with the table of contents and two sample chapters. But I will start the themes of, of, of my talk with a simple uh, visual here. Um, and it's the cover of the book, uh, which I was very delighted to, that um, Bloomsbury, who published the book last February, um, did... Um, did a great job of um, putting this on the two covers of the two volume work. Um, and if you look at, at what this is a depiction is of the traditional um, seven mercies of Christian tradition, uh, which most churchgoers would be familiar with from um, the 25th chapter of, of Matthew, um, when um, uh, the disciples asked Christ, well, you know, what can we do for you? More or less, he said, well, whatever you do unto the least of these, you're actually doing it unto me. You're doing it unto me. So in the lower left there, you see the baker and his wife handing out bread. And behind them, there are some well-dressed people uh, uh, um, giving drink to the thirsty. And then um, in the lower right, um, there is a well-dressed uh, guy. I think he's probably a cloth merchant giving out clothes to the naked. And further up on the right, there's um, someone visiting the sick. And then a little further up there, there's someone taking in a wayfarer. You can't quite see, but up sort of in the middle, there's um, someone visiting a prison. Although, as often happened that time, the, the people would uh, just talk to them from out, prisoners from the outside and hand things in a window, rather crude prisons back in that day. Well, I think that makes six, but there's a seventh one that wasn't in chapter 25 that was um, very um, important in the Middle Ages, and that was burying the dead. So many paupers were too poor to, to even get a burial. So but back in the distance, they're, they're burying the dead. 
And one thing I want to really emphasize about this is that although the theme is very religious, you're not seeing this carried out in any um, by the church or by any uh, clerical figures. Uh, these are all lay people, and they're in the public square. So it's sort of a combination of individuals exercising charity, but they're all doing it in community as part of their civic duty, really, in the in the public square. And I think that's quite important because I think often people think, well, before the welfare state, uh, charity was all the either people giving out to individual beggars or it was all managed by the church. And so what um, I really want to emphasize is that there's a civic tradition going back at least 500 years and more actually in, in the Renaissance and civic culture before. And then um, private activity and religious activity continues through modern history as well. And we have the Christian Democrats very active in the welfare state. So um, I want to you know, emphasize this, um, this background. Um, so there was this um, obligation of individuals and then um, the action of the magistrates both had to um, come uh, together. And the central idea of the book is that th this tradition, which um, really kind of uh, um, took a modern shape around 1500, uh, has a life of its own and it continues to inform the policies and practices of the welfare state in, in Europe. And no doubt it will continue to evolve. It's not a static entity. It's that, and that's something that um, uh, I really emphasize with that subtitle of reform without end. Um, and of course, there's a legacy from the Middle Ages going way back. Um, so let me just outline the, uh, the structure of, of the book and the, the way it's set up in four major parts that are just a very rough chronology. Um, so the first is what I call the threshold of modernity, talking about the innovations that took place um, in the first few decades of the um, 16th century, which was also the decade of the outbreak of the Reformation. And there's often discussion of how these were related, but um, it wasn't just the Reformation, it was a whole civic initiative that created this sort of new model of charity. And parts, the, the remaining three parts are divided in, into a chronology of about 150 years each. So uh, part two, um, you know, um, takes you up to 1700. And then I kind of leap over this bridge period from 1700 to 1850, which includes the, the French Revolution and all the upheaval that came with that and with the growth of uh, industrial society. And then the last part is uh, since 1850, which includes the traditional history um, of, of the welfare state. So I try to bring this to light with leading individuals and I don't have as much I'd like to say about the poor themselves struggling to make ends meet in what the historian Olin Houghton called an economy of makeshifts. But let me introduce you to a couple of leading characters in each part. It, the book opens with um, a true leading lady uh, the Dowager Queen Leonor of uh, Portugal, who was kind of in charge of things when her brother was off in Spain on a marriage project. And uh, she um, gathered with the chief uh, citizens of Lisbon uh, at the cathedral and um, launched um, an institution uh, called the Casa de Misericordia, or the House of Mercy. Um, and the structure was traditional uh, in the, as a, a confraternity uh, which were very common all over Southern Europe and Italy and, and Spain, uh, of um, citizens often out of uh, our guilds of different uh, crafts and trades uh, who would band together for their own mutual um, support and benefit, and also usually a lot of feasting and drinking. But uh, the purpose of this um, new um, Misericordia was uh, to uh, perform uh, the seven mercies. And uh, they're... they're couple of things that are particularly interesting about it um, in terms of the modern impulse. One is um, that it really did have a uh, territory, an impulse from the state. Um, and um, uh, Queen Leonor and um, her brother, when he came back, really promoted the Lisbon Charter and urged every town in Portugal to establish one. And so they would pass out the model charter and say, hey, look at this, why don't you start one too? And it spread all over Portugal. And so that another interesting idea of sort of a, a model that spreads 
and um, and in fact, it spread all over the Portuguese Empire as well. So that to this day, there are relics of it in in Macau, in um, Salvador do Bahia, in Brazil, in the Azores, um, all all over uh, the Portuguese Empire. So that was um, an, a figure that I I uh, dealt with at the very beginning, um, and these uh, confraternities also became involved in um, the development of um, institute the hospitals, which is not quite like we think of a hospital today. It was partly to take in the sick poor, but also the poor and helpless of all varieties. And um, one development that also was uh, already going strong in the 15th century uh, from top-down initiatives was to gather together the very small uh, hospitals in the Middle Ages, which maybe only had three or four beds or, you know, dedicated to a saint or something, and to try to consolidate them into larger institutions that could serve more people. So um, this is kind of institution was called a general hospital. And so you find them all over um, Southern Europe, um, Barcelona, Valencia, Milan. And then uh, it's sort of a resurgence of uh, the general hospital, which served a whole variety of, of of um, uh, clients on a fairly large scale in 17th century uh, France. Um, now, um, I was talking just about a, a Queen Leonor, but actually uh, a great deal of the impulse, or in fact, the almost the classical uh, 16th century innovation was um, carried out on the municipal level. And cities in Italy had really uh, promoted various forms of charity and hospitals, and uh, a number of towns in the um, in the 16th century wanted to make charity more efficient and bring it under a kind of um, direction, a central direction under the city magistrates. And so, um, what often appears is a, a system of collecting donations instead of individuals giving out alms. They said. If you really want to make sure that it's it's um, um, you know serves its purpose, uh, contribute it to the common chest, and then also there would be a structure set up, usually on the parish or local level, to investigate uh, the needs of the parishioners and then to distribute aid on that basis, testing what the need was. So it was in a sense um, a little kernel of bureaucracy, um, but it was also um, a, a sense of um, uh, creating a, a civic model um, where citizens would, would be involved in um, making sure that needs was um, served. Now, the spirit and substance of this emergent model was carried, was, was captured in a treatise that I want to talk about um, by a Christian humanist who came from Valencia, Spain, um, and then migrated north to the universities in, in Flanders and then eventually even to Oxford. Um, and uh, he wrote in 1526, wrote a treatise, um, which he addressed to the citizens of Bruges about um, the idea, the ideal model as he saw it for um, civic charity and how it should be ad administered. And historians have often commented on how this treatise was, was captured a really modern spirit. And um, I took this up and really um, delved into it and into the life of Vives to suggest that in a very um, profound way, um, it represents a tradition that continues to this day. So that's a rather ambitious argument, but I will tell you a, a little bit about, about, well, I'll tell you quite a bit about Vives because he's really probably the most important figure um, in the book. Um, his last name is spelled V-I-V-E-S. Sometimes there's a uh, confusion about the term humanist or Christian humanist. Um, those of you remember the old fashioned Western Civ course, um, humanism um, uh, rose in, in Italy, particularly with an interest in classical literature. And um, around um, the time of um, uh, around 1500, um, there were uh, some leading humanists that you would, would probably know in, in that Western Civ course, notably Erasmus, Erasmus of Rotterdam, um, who um, was intent on um, reviving Christianity by going back to the original text of the gospel 
and also reviving a uh, classical text of, Lat uh, of Latin literature and Greek Latin and Greek literature and philosophy. And he's so central to the tradition, you know, that the European Union today invokes Erasmus in, in its scholarship program for, for students. And I describe, although Vives is the center of, of my analysis, he's really part of this circus, uh, circle of humanists, including also most notably um, Thomas More. Um, and so I talk about this new uh, outlook as um, uh, an Erasmian conscience. I've just been amazed by Vives' uh, own biography um, and uh, uh, how he um, uh, how he uh, developed his um, his idea uh, from coming from a background of uh, conversos in Valencia um, and. Um, So he, he, he um, his ancestors were among Jews who had converted to Christianity under duress a century, a century earlier. Although they were practicing Christians, they preserved community ties and their burial ground. They celebrated mass in their old synagogue and persecution revived in Valencia in the early 16th century from fear of clandestine Jewish influence. And uh, Vives ancestors were implicated. And while he was in Flanders, writing his treatise on poor relief, his father and other family were arrested and put to death while an ancestor was exhumed, buried, and his ashes spread on the river Turio. So I still wonder how he could identify as a Christian scholar, um, but this was not exceptional among conversos in early modern Spain who often achieved high influence in the church and the state. So um, brought up in this a family of, of merchants who traded all the Mediterranean up to Flanders, he went on from school in Valencia to Paris and then to Louvain, what's now Belgium, and his writing attracted Erasmus, uh, who called on him to ad, um, edit a new version of St. Augustine's City of God. So quickly, because I already see I'm eating into my time here, the elements of this Erasmian, Erasmian conscience, which I kind of extracted from his treatise, are th sort of three general themes, um, and they were all originally in, in Latin, so the simple Latin words, but um, beneficence, which in, it was doing good or benefaciendum, uh, which was a blend of Christian teaching and ancient classical authors such as Cicero, uh, Seneca, and Aristotle, arguing for an obligation to act to do good in uh, in a spirit of mutual aid. Erasmus touched on this in several cases, most notably in one of his conversations or colloquies, the godly feast. Uh, when he was, there came a question of charitable giving came up, you know, he said, it's not easy to decide whom to give to or how much, but the underlying principle was to do good for all, um, whatever their particular need was, and to serve it well. And so Vives' treatise laid out a, a kind of basic plan for determining needs in housing and caring for them. A second principle was law, or in Latin, it would be lex, you know, the, the law. And um, Vives agreed with others in Erasmus' circle that law had to be an instrument for the public good, and that it was kind of like urban infrastructure that had to be constantly renewed. You keep the laws up to date so that they serve the community. Um, and uh, Vives complete poor law, compared poor law measures with actions to um, maintain bridges and canals. And his own uncle had been a lawyer in Valencia and, and uh, talked about the great principles of the just and the good in, in Roman law. And he had colleagues who were lawyers too. So one of the um, um, you know, um, uh, historians of, of Belgium uh, talked about this alliance of humanists, jurists, and merchants or capitalists uh, who came together to to create this kind of model of, of relief. And one uh, uh, final th third theme that really comes out is that of work or labor. And um, it was partly, you know, that's been a very controversial or, you know, create all kinds of questions and anxieties and, and problems, the whole, how do you treat work in relation to uh, to welfare? We certainly have that issue today. And um, it starts with Erasmus and, and Vives feeling that the high value placed to the church on vows of poverty and a life of prayer and contemplation undermined the value of honest work. And so they saw all kinds of work as a necessary form of human fulfillment. And so it was important for the civic community to encourage uh, 
the idle to uh, become active and, and productive citizens come out of their squalor and be true citizens. Um, well, I don't, I, I've gone too far on, on, on uh, section one here, but that is in a way the most important section found setting the foundation of the book. I'll go quickly over part two, uh, which is the theme of discipline from the death of Vives in 1540 up to 1700. And there are many, it takes many forms, but it's certainly in, um, shaped by the religious conflict between in the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic response. And each religious confession wants discipline in order to purge abuses in, in theology and in practice and to build a beloved household of faith, of community, and but at the same time to be ready to, to fight the opposing um, uh, confession. Um, so there's a kind of, um, you could say that some of these Erasmian ideas were weaponized in the battle between Protestantism and the church. So Calvin and Loyola come into the picture. Um, the Elizabethan poor law provide a new framework after the monasteries were abolished, particularly, and they had given some aid. In Germany, a Lutheran prince, Philip of Hesse, confiscated ecclesiastical property to create a famous hospital. On the Catholic side, the Cardinal Archbishop of Milan, Carlo Borromeo, represents the model approach to the oversight by the bishop, um, the role reaffirmed under the, the um, aegis of the Catholic Council of Trent that was both a, a meeting to reform the church and to make it um, ready to do battle against heresy and, and uh, the uh, so-called reformers. Um, if you have ever come across um, Foucault, Foucault's writing about madness, he put a great emphasis on what was called the great confinement of the disorderly poor and, and the insane. And he called, talked about the creation of the, the Paris Hospital General in 1656. Um, and again, this is sort of, it, historians you know, criticize Foucault a lot because in part the General Hospital was just a renewal of a somewhat older um, concept, but it did spread in France at that time under the, um, with the promotion of Louis XIV. But at the same time, a voluntary form of charitable discipline emerged at least as famous. Vincent de Paul worked with Madame de Mirabion and other ladies of charity to train peasant women uh, to serve local communities and, and place, they trained them in Paris and then sent them out under a rule particular that was to be observed by any institution that accepted them or community. And these were the, um, the sisters of charity. Um, which uh, assumed a, a very major role in European society. So moving quickly to volume two, and I am going to try to uh, go through this uh, very quickly. Um, at the front of volume two, I put a um, printed document from the French Revolution called the Livre de la Bienfaisance Nationale. So uh, you get beneficence echoing in this very uh, resonant French term, la bienfaisance. Which was a great, you know, uh, you know, enlightenment ideal of doing good, um, especially uh, with by uh, applying enlightened knowledge, especially and rationality uh, to uh, social institutions. So, um, in the in the revolution, this um, uh, uh, was the product of uh, the last stage of, the, I mean, not the Jacobin stage of the of the. Um, uh, of, of the revolution um, in um, 1794. It had been preceded by a very thorough review of the problems of welfare and poverty under the Constituent Assembly, under a, a very um, uh, interesting liberal aristocrat, uh, the, the Duke de la Rochefoucauld Lyoncourt, who presided over this. And with him worked a number of people who'd been involved in welfare institutions, including a, a very minor figure, one that you'll never hear of, Leclerc de Molineau, whom I was familiar with from previous work, who had experimented with ways of putting beggars back to work by giving them good incentives and giving them hope for uh, a more secure and comfortable life. And uh, so Molineau was, was drawn into this. Uh, and um, the uh, 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 revolutionary authorities pursued a number of the ideas, but in the turbulence of the time, uh, a lot of the implementation, implementation was never really successful. But there was an, um, a certain 
um, implementation of this uh, Jacobin Libre de la Bienfaisance Nationale, um, which was um, interesting, I think, in terms of the long-term tradition, in that it really was based on um, democratic citizenship. Um, the, uh, in principle, but not so much in practice, the Jacobins really established the idea of a, um, uh, of, of a democratic citizenship, and the recipients were also citizens. So there was that um, establishment of notion that the welfare and later the welfare state is kind of a contract uh, with with all citizens and by citizens. So um, the revolution is very important from that point of view. And I really don't want to take more time um, talking about that because there's there's more um, to say both about part three, um, political economy, uh, modern uh, market economics. The title that I have for part three, The Grumbling Hive, refers to a poem by the English writer Bernard Mandeville in England, who argued that charity schools and work projects were counterproductive and that the vices of a commercial society um, were the engine of national prosperity. So private vices or public benefits was his scandalous motto. Well, in spite of his endorsement of doing nothing for the poor, um, um, philanthropy uh, blossomed in um, England. And so that's another interesting part of the story particularly about the notion of the citizen coming together with other citizens in association to produce um, effective philanthropy. And one very nice example of that was the London Foundling Hospital, uh, founded through the efforts of a col colorful shipbuilder, uh, Thomas Coram. And if you are in, uh, next, in London, uh, it's a fascinating museum. And on top floor, they have a, 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 a room devoted to Handel because he was a great uh, patron. And there were artists like Hogarth and others who contributed in various ways to the London Foundling um, Museum. At the end of part three, I also um, give a, a, a bit of a glance on um, Germany with the failed revolutions of 1848 and the role of the of Dr. Rudolf Virchow, uh, who worked at the Berlin Charity Hospital. And um, during the revolution, he published a weekly medical journal and he became a thoroughgoing democratic revolutionary, partly because of what he had seen when he had been sent on a mission to investigate the epidemic in Silesia. And he just said the authorities had neglected the condition of the, of the poor and, and sick just terribly. And it said, you know, you're not going to have um, uh, public health or any concern for the poor without a democratic constitution. And so this, this idea I think is important and informs the later German tradition um, of the Weimar Republic. The last part really then does bring you into um, the uh, welfare state period after um, 1850. And uh, one little device that I caught that I rather liked by a Danish social science Henning, scientist, Henning Fries, talked about social competition. Um, and there's always this exchange of models and people saying, um, what's the best way to uh, run a, um, to, to provide for the poor and, and the needs of, um, of welfare. And so there was a lot of exchange of information and even a, a pride in having succeeded um, better than, than others. Um, Bismarck, so let, let me just do kind of a little gallery of names and I can't say much about them. Bismarck, of course, comes in, but much people you've never heard of, or unless you were reading the literature of the period, um, up to, uh, uh, used the autobiography of Alice Solomon, uh, who obtained a doctorate in the late 19th century and founded a school of social welfare. And she linked up internationally with British activists and with Jane Addams of the US. And uh, so there was quite an interest in all kinds of voluntary associations in um, uh, pre uh, Germany before World War I. Do certainly uh, deal the best I can with the tragedy of Weimar and the Third Reich, and then the evolution of re the recapture really of the Weimar principles blended with some of the Bismarck tradition um, after what um, the Germans called, you know, zero hour or Stunde Null, and created um, their Sozialstaat. And um, uh, socialists were involved, like Willy Brandt, but in in some sense, the, he is the most important player at the outset was a Christian Democrat, Konrad Adenauer, the former mayor of Cologne, 
Um, and then later, the Christian Democrat Helmut Kohl, who guided Germany and its welfare system through the period of reunification with um, the East Germany. And in England, of course, we have William Beveridge, who, um, whose report during the war in 1943 was the blueprint for Britain's post-war welfare state. And he invoked John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress with the promise of driving away the five giants, which were want, hunger, idleness, disease, and ignorance. But I trace this back and narrate um, um, the importance of the 1880s in the ferment of ideas and re reforms um, at that time in, in Britain. And I bring in Beatrice uh, Potter, who then married um, Sidney Webb, and so she's also known as Beatrice Webb. She'd worked on the study of the London poor with Charles Booth and um, took part in a, a commission for the reform of the poor law in 1910. And so there are cameo appearances of Brit British figures. You may, labor leaders, Keir Hardy and I, Bevan, you've heard of Churchill, Lloyd George. Uh, and Churchill, of course, was a great reformer early on. And then uh, Clement Attlee and, of course, the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher. Too much to say about France. <laughs> but after a lot of the tumult in the Third Republic, which kind of settled in, also kind of really importantly in the 1880s, the, the Republican leader, the leaders who cons really wanted to create a democratic republic, but liberal and, and stable, um, uh, voiced this notion of solidarism of institutions that would bring the whole community together, including support for those in greatest need. And of course, a great emphasis on education and uh, uh, education in a Republican lay, you know, secular vein. Um, and two figures that I spent quite a bit of time on um, in the 20th century, one is René Cassin, who you may have heard of in terms of the Declaration of Human Rights, because he took a great part in that along with Elmer Roosevelt and Canadian figure, but he um, was badly wounded in World War I, and um, his interest in welfare grew out of uh, aid to, to veteran, the veterans and even to German veterans. Another figure who really was the father of the modern French welfare state, Pierre Larocque, um, was uh, had a Jewish family background on his mother's side. He, was, he had uh, risen very rapidly um, to the highest uh, uh, Council of State um, in France as a legal expert, but uh, under Vichy, when they discovered his Jewish connection, he was bounced out of that. And um, connecting with um, friends in Lyon, he became part of the resistance, and the British uh, managed to pick him out of a field in the middle of the night, took him to England, became part of the resistance council. And he was with the first invasion forces on D-Day trying to help set up French institutions. And he was called on to help set up um, a new welfare state. So um, talk about the Nordic model um, and um, Gunnar and Alva Murdell come in there. And um, an, a work, an important work written by an American journalist, Marcus Childs in 1936 uh, called The Middle Way, which kind of started the whole discussion of Scandinavian models in, in American society. I put, put a lot of um, uh, discussion in the last part about how social rights have gradually been incorporated in the structure of the European Union. Um, it's very complicated and I love the expression that one of the experts on the e EU institutions talks about the origami of the EU with so many uh, folds of institutions folding into each other and documents that build on earlier documents. But um, in one sense, I talk about my book as going from Lisbon to Lisbon because um, uh, I imagine what it would be like if Queen Leonor came back to the council meeting in the year 2000 when they were uh, really returning to the social question in a big way. And one of the things that they did was institute a, a process for exchanging information and, and best practices called the open method of coordination, which I think is very characteristic of the European tradition, where co countries and cities have their different uh, contexts and settings and ways of doing things, but they're always comparing with each other and they're trying to learn from the best practices of the other. So I think I'd better leave it there, except to say with my prognosis, I uh, uh, <laughs> take a not surprising uh, uh, take on a uh, combination of equality and sustainability. Um, so, uh, and I build on um, 
the work of the economist Amartya Sen, with a word that really strikes me as important, the notion of promoting capability, uh, looking at every individual and seeing what they are capable of and, and promoting that capability. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And we've got a couple of questions here. Um, <clears throat> one of them is that uh, your book is $145 on the Bloomsbury website. How can the poor scholars in the audience get a look at it? Um, I, that question is, and you know, it's not 140, I think it's 245. And, um, you know, I t my editor was wonderful in, you know, producing the book, but I think there was sort of a devil's bargain that in order to produce a book as, uh, that was over 700 pages, um, they would have to put it on the reference book shelf, which annoyed me greatly because I really wanted it to be for more general public. And I haven't even be re been reviewed by Scott his historians yet because um, it hasn't been promoted as much as I would like with... Um, history journals but um i'm i'm working at it and uh, my hope is that if i get enough exposure and i've been invited to one of my favorite meetings uh, uh, to do a meet the author session um, at a meeting of european social science history conference next year and um i hope if it gets enough exposure with historians uh, bloomsbury press will be willing to bring out a paperback version and when they do that, I hope they'll put a decent price on it. So I just have to, you know, <laughs> hope for the best. And I really apologize for the horrendous price. If any of you have access to a, a, a research library, make sure they buy it. <laughs> right. Next question is, uh, do you cover E.P. Thompson's influence on the thinking of the European New Left? No, I don't actually, but he's just a tremendously important uh, social historian, uh, especially about the importance of, well, the making of the Europe working class and, um, you know, its, its struggles um, in, in a, um, uh, but I'd be interested in hearing your take on that because I think it's certainly relevant to the role of, um, of labor. And what I would say, because I can't really speak directly to E.P. Thompson's influence in the way you asked, but there was a question, particularly in England, uh, about social scientists asking whether uh, the birth of the Labour Party and the influence of labor unions um, had an influence in creating the British welfare state. And, uh, and some people say, well, it wasn't really that much because it was the politicians and the intellectuals and the Fabians and all these who really made the difference. But... I certainly maintain in the book that those people wouldn't have gone anywhere if it weren't for the presence of strong labor movements, especially, you know, 19, 1890 with uh, what they call the, the Dockers Tanner, when you had one of the first big industrial unions uh, demanding a sixpence wage increase, you know. And then you had leading figures like Keir Hardy was tremendous influence. And he came in, he finally was elected into parliament in collaboration with uh, Independent Labor Party. And he insisted on, you know, wearing very plain working men's clothes, greatly scandalizing uh, people. And, and one of the tailoring institutions said, we offered to give him a nice suit, but he just wore his crummy clothes. <laughs> anyway, I, I think there's a, you know, there is this kind of symbiosis between uh, labor, uh, end up labor pressure and, and, um, uh, Workers of hand and brain as the labor part, the workers of the brain as and politicians as the uh, um, labor party sometimes expressed it. The follow up comment: There's also a huge influence from Methodism. Um. Yes, and um, I think that's why the. There's a strong religious um, component to uh, all uh, advocacy for welfare in Britain. Um, and one of the things that I emphasize um, is the uh, wartime use of, of um, the, the Jerusalem uh, hymn based on Blake. Uh, uh, and building a, a new Jerusalem was built here in England's green and pleasant land. 
And the Labour Party really took up on, on that, and I think there's a Methodist strain behind that. Um, and um, and then um, they really, you know, drove that very hard. There's kind of an irony that they sang the song on the, the Labour Conference in 1950, just before they lost to the Conservatives again. Um, and then some people, Labour, you know, uh, one of the, I think it was uh, either Blair or his, one of his uh, Labour confreres who, said we weren't going to be emphasizing new Jerusalem new Jerusalemism. Um, we're going to be very hard-nosed about labor. So um, there's a little bit of self-consciousness about the uh, uh, religious fervor behind um, uh, the Labor Party's approach to welfare. <laughs> Next question is, do you think that welfare for everyone has become more institutionalized rather than the earlier versions you talked about from the 15 and 1600s? Well, it's definitely become more institutionalized. And, and um, you know, there's the whole, I think very simply, there's a really a good question is, uh, what does bureaucracy do well? You know, and um, it's very good at sending out social security checks. Um, it may not uh, really, uh, you know, bureaucracy doesn't, really solve all problems on a local and community level. So you really need to have input on all, all levels. And it's very interesting in debates over that in Europe, one thing that the Christian Democrats introduced was the notion of subsidiarity, which would got adopted in um, the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992, um, which was that um, government at a higher level shouldn't intervene in doing things that can be done at a lower level. So there was the notion that there's kind of a pyramid of responsibility with things being built from the bottom up. <clears throat> and it was based on a, actually a Catholic um, uh, pronouncement in the 1930s, which was meant really as a protection of family, but it's become a, a broader principle in the EU. So looking across <clears throat> all of these different welfare programs and approaches, you know, all over Europe and the U.S., <clears throat> are there any that, that you think are especially successful? Uh, I think there are. And, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about whether there is such a thing as a European social model. And um, there is not one single model. And, and they, you know, I remember a wonderful... Um, discussion by researchers who were writing on Scandinavian welfare who talked about uh, the Scandinavian social model and the six exceptions because even though they get this great similarity there there are differences among them uh, but a French politician um, Martin Aubry said you know that there are these differences but if you look at it from other continents and especially the United States um, there's a lot of commonality but I think there there is um um, you know, there's successes of different kinds and, and limitations. Um, I, uh, one of our good colleagues at uh, NEH spent a, a term in Finland, and he said, you know, it was very placid and quiet there, but also uh, there was a, a rather wonderful feeling of equality and security. And it was really kind of marvelous. I think Finland has really achieved quite a model of, of the welfare state, and it's still, you know, as entrepreneurs and produces in, you know, uh, in industry on, a, on an international level. And so the question is, you know, how think, why do things work well in one country and they don't, other countries don't follow the example. Um, I think there are possibilities for addressing these whole basic questions of security and capability uh, with any of the model, including our own. I mean, um, scholars have pointed out that the United States does have a welfare state. It's just not like the ones in Europe, and it has a lot of holes in it that could be fixed. <laughs> okay, does anybody else have any additional questions? Uh, actually, I do. Um, what are the chances of the US, because of our diversity, one of the reasons they say uh, the uh, Nordic countries do so well at welfare is there a fairly homogenous population? How much does our diversity sort of 
um, work against the idea of having a welfare system that gives each person what they need according to their abilities and their needs. I'm not sure that the diversity is so much the problem as um, our um, tradition as a as a really as a settler society that came into what they would like to think was a virgin land <laughs> and uh, just um, you know um, created a tremendous culture of individualism. Um, you know, so I I don't think it it I mean. There are pressures of diversity, um, like in, in Europe, the, right now there's a tremendous pressure because migrants are coming in at, at such a, a, a drastic pace and, and it's, it's frightening. Um, but they've been very successful in absorbing m migrants and uh, the whole question of outsiders has been with European welfare states forever. Um, it's just sort of the question of the particular moment and, and what the, uh, how people perceive crisis of outsiders, because um, most Western countries have actually uh, absorbed uh, a great diversity as we have in the United States and we're perfectly capable of it. And, you know, um, people want um, more bodies to work in the fields and, and uh, fill jobs in the United States. So there's sort of a, a um, a uh, problem of consciousness, uh, uh, um, I, th I think, is perfectly possible um, if we can sort of get over our hangups about serving a diverse population. Uh, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia all are settler uh, countries that don't have as much stress around the idea of welfare state. Mm -hmm. So somehow the idea that it's because we're a settler country to me, that doesn't explain it, given the example of Canada. Yeah, I get you. That's certainly right. I think, though, that we have, for all kinds of political reasons, we have really um, developed a, a kind of a stake in this antagonism to um, to state action. Um, and I think you've had that in Canada also, and also in Australia and New Zealand. But there, there was in one feature of, of settler states too is that they're open to experimentation and they've all experimented in different ways. I think New Zealand was very early in setting up certain pension plans um, that were you know, promoted in England as, as a model. And of course, we had the great experiment of, of, of the New Deal uh, which, however, created a tremendous backlash as well. Um, you know, so I, I, I just often often wonder there's something very peculiar about our own mentality. Um, when you think about how wedded everyone is to Social Security, or when you think of what tremendous benefits came to the economy and the society from the GI Bill, um, increasing capability, um, the U.S. is open to things on sort of an experimental level, but then it still maintains this backlash, I, you know, it's, it's hard to figure out sometimes. Okay, anybody else? If you like, I could say a little bit more about the EU. Um, when one particular figure that I found absolutely fascinating, I'll just tell you a little bit about him if, if, if you don't have other questions. Yeah. If we have just a couple minutes. Um, in the, you know, there was a, I think it's generally accepted that one of the impulse for the post-World War II welfare states was a sense that um, it, uh, insecurity was certainly a factor in political instability um, throughout Europe. And also nationalism uh, was uh, a, um, a negative factor. Um, and so there were efforts both to, to gather together, overcome nationalist hostilities, um, and um, you know, also to provide greater security and to reaffirm uh, human rights. And so that was just very prominent uh, you know, in the writing of René Cassin in, in France. But one of the most interesting cases to me was 
that of an Italian Federalist named Altiero Spinelli. And um, he uh, grew up in, in Rome fighting Mussolini's uh, squadristi. And uh, uh, he joined the Communist Party for a while. And um, although he got kicked out of it uh, later on because he criticized Stalin and a few other things, but um, the Mussolini's people threw him in jail along with a whole lot of other communists and leftists and you know liberals, everybody that they that didn't work with them. And he ended up on the island of Ventotene in the Adriatic, and um, with some other uh, people. They called it sort of the school of the of the, of the resistance. Um, they came up with a uh, a charter uh, of, of Ventotene for a federalist renewal of Europe, especially in Italy, um, that would try to overcome nationalism and create political unity. And when he got out of jail at the end of the war, Spinelli pursued this and tried to get together with other European federalists and pursued a campaign all, all through his, his career. And eventually he um, was, and he was very um, interested in what was going on in the United States under the Kennedy administration for that matter. But he um, um, became uh, a uh, member of the European parliament and worked with others in, in a cafe called the Crocodilo uh, to come up with a constitution for Europe which would have greater political unity and a social dimension as well. And um, that was in the mid eighties in, in um, uh, the parliament actually, the European parliament recommended this and Mitterrand who was head of the, the commission at that point said he was in favor of it. But when they got the council of ministers together, they say, no, this is going too far. So they didn't do that. And the single European act in 1986 was very far from what Spinelli uh, had hoped for. So <laughs> His his uh, you know complaint at the end was you know I felt like the old man in the sea and then by the time I I got back to port you know the sharks had all eaten up the carcass <laughs> so there was a lot of um, you know of moving forward and backward and the social dimension has always kind of played second second fiddle to the economic and one reason for that is uh, because one of the great arguments for prosperity was that it depended on productivity. And one of the key episodes in the EU about, that had to do with this was um, during the um, uh, presidency of Mitterrand. He had great plans for spending a lot of money. And his, his minister, Jacques Delors, said, we don't have the money. We're going to have to have austerity. But that also led to a commitment to um, stronger uh, trade within the EU and the capability of France and other countries um, to be more competitive, more prosperous through the institutions of the European Union. So there was a great debate for that and, and Jacques Delors became a leading advocate of this. And um, he actually greatly antagonized Margaret, Margaret Thatcher who thought this was just terrible, you know, putting the social dimension in the EU when we, well, what we really want to do is make it better for our uh, bankers and, and uh, you know, merchants in the city of London, uh, which he was very successful at doing, that's why, you know, one wondered, you know, what she would think of Brexit because she knew very well that the EU would be a great benefit to your England's financial community. So there's a lot of this back and forth about uh, how you how you fold a social dimension in, and um, since the European Court of Justice has so much to do with enforcing competition, does that squeeze out social measures? Well, they do have a special category of societies of general economic influence. You know, if it's promoting, you know, development and, and uh, productivity among the citizens, that doesn't necessarily infringe on competition. So there's a lot of balancing act within the EU um, and the, the social dimension is always kind of struggling there and, um, and also struggling within each country. You know, they're often saying, well, the welfare state's in big trouble, but, um, for all the antagonism to migrants and antagonism to the bureaucracy of the EU, most Europeans, the last thing they want to do is give up their health care or the European or, or their, their welfare state. And, you know, a lot of the great upset in Britain because it's been pared back so much from its uh, original conception. So I've rattled on to fill up the last five minutes. Well, <laughs> and and we're right at 11 o'clock. So unless there's a final <laughs> question, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, Tom, I want to thank you. This was fascinating stuff and uh, really 
interesting how broad and deep you were able to dive into all of this. So thank you. Thank you again. Well, it was great fun. And believe me, I'm really delighted to have you all as an audience. <laughs> thank you. Have you right. uh, thought of going to the libraries and giving presentations there? Well, actually, I've, I've offered, you know, I'm actually a library associate at, at Georgetown University, and I use some of their their special collections. And, uh, you know, I, I thought I offered there and I haven't heard a peep. And uh, the Library of Congress, which I use regularly, sometimes has presentations in various forums there. And, um, you know, I'm just not well known. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. You have to be well known and connected. And I have, you know, I haven't heard a peep back from the um, uh, the um, uh, watching the history seminar either, which kind of surprised me. So, you know, I keep trying. GMU, please. <laughs> GMU. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. There's a, 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 a <laughs> try Professor McGraw. <laughs> <laughs>